All right, we're back in another Sound of the Battle Cry. And today, we're going to continue the series on the history of the Jesuits. And the name of the message today is Founding of the Order, uh, Spiritual Exercises, Visualization, Imagination. We're going to be continuing the history of the beginning of the Jesuit Order. And today, we're going to be talking about the founding, the beginning. This chapter in J.A. Wiley's book, History of Protestantism, is called... Loyola's first disciples. So we're going to learn about the first disciples uh, of the Jesuit order and of uh, Ignatius Loyola himself and, and the co-founders. And also, you know, not only are we going to talk about history, but we're going to talk about, like I said, the exercises, spiritual exercises and uh, this concept of visualization. And, and we're going to compare a lot of that to the Bible. And so there's going to be a lot of different uh, concepts and teachings that I'm going to be integrating throughout here. i got a lot of different notes and highlights throughout this text. So, um, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of information in here. It's not just going to be going through and reading the history of it. Uh, so a lot of lessons to be learned. So, um, so last teaching that we did... Um, Ignatius Loyola, his origin story, we learned that, you know, there was a lot of um, uh, self-punishment. He, you know, would punish himself for his sins. There'd be flagellation, starving himself, beating himself. Uh, and, and honestly, to the point of him making himself have visions, uh, he starved himself inside a cave for a long time until that happened. And he was like half dead there. You know, a lot of these types of things happening over and over again. But the basis of the majority of his zeal came from visions that he had. That's what we learned. Visions of uh, Mary and Christ and these other types of things. He believed that these visions were guiding him and pointing him in the right direction to uh, have this vision ultimately for this order. And now we're going to see where it finally comes to fruition and the very beginning and founding of the Jesuit order. Okay, so let's get into the information. Among the wonderful things shown to Ignatius Loyola by special revelation was a vision of two great camps. Okay, and I got that highlighted by special revelation was a vision because over and over again, you know, the beginning of the influence on Ignatius Loyola and uh, the vision for the founding of the order and everything comes from these visions that he has. Okay? He has visions over and over again. The last teaching we learned he had over 30 visions of Mary and, and Christ and all this other type of stuff. And again, here we see it again. By special revelation, he has a vision. Okay? So there's a vision of two great camps. The center of the one was placed at Babylon and over it there floated the gloomy ensign of the Prince of Darkness. The heavenly king had erected his standard on Mount Zion and made Jerusalem his headquarters. In the war of which these two camps were the symbols and the issues of which were to be grand beyond all former precedent, Loyola was chosen, he believed, to be one of the chief captains. He longed to place himself at the center of action. The way thither was long. Wide oceans and gloomy deserts had to be traversed, and hostile tribes passed through. But he had an iron will, a boundless enthusiasm, and what was more, a divine call for such it seemed to him in his delusion. Okay, so I got this highlighted here that he had a boundless enthusiasm. And a scripture we have to go along with that is Romans chapter 10 verse 2 which says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Okay? And I did a full message on this. Zeal not according to knowledge. And basically, I talk about in that message how dangerous it is to have zeal, even saying you have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Not according to the knowledge of the Word of God and sound doctrine. When you just have a strong zeal, like it says here, a boundless enthusiasm, but it's for the wrong thing, it's very, very dangerous. And it often results, especially when uh, it has to do with religious zeal. I, talk about, I, call, I think the full title is The Evil Fruit of Religious Zeal. And the fruit, the evil fruit is persecution. 
It always results in persecuting others who don't subscribe to that belief. That's why we. That's what we see throughout the history of the Catholic Church and the Inquisition, and that's what we see in the history of Islam. They have a strong zeal for God in their minds, but not according to knowledge. So it ends up in death and violence and uh, very, very dark things. So that's a, a scripture that definitely applies to Ignatius Loyola with his boundless enthusiasm. Uh, okay, so he set out penniless and begging his bread by the way, he arrived at Barcelona. There he embarked in a ship which landed him on the shore of Italy. Thence traveling on foot after long months and innumerable hardships, he entered in safety the gates of Jerusalem. Okay, so I got one more point here. It's just interesting that it says he was uh, begging his bread by the way. When it's almost exactly a scripture that occurs in Psalm 37. Psalm 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now this is a promise in the word of God that, you know, God takes care of his children. God provides. God always provides for his people. And that's what this promise is. And it says, I have not seen his seed, the righteous seed begging bread. But here we, he, we see Ignatius Loyola was begging his bread, by the way. Why did he have to beg bread? Uh, I don't think that's something that you should do. You shouldn't beg bread. Now, you know, um, saints will get poor sometimes, absolutely. But not begging bread. It's definitely not something that they should be doing. Okay? So I just thought was that was interesting as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so let's continue. But the reception that awaited him in the holy city was not such as he had fondly anticipated. His rags, his uncombed locks, which almost hid his emaciated features, but ill accorded with the magnificence of the errand which had brought him to that shore. Loyola thought of doing in his single person what the armies of the Crusaders had failed to do by their combined strength. He was very confident in himself. The head of the Romanists in Jerusalem saw in him rather the mendicant than the warrior. He saw, him, he saw a beggar. And fearing doubtless that should he offer battle to the Crescent, the Muslims, he was more likely to provoke a tempest of Turkish fanaticism than drive back the hordes of the infidel. He commanded him to desist under the threat of excommunication. Thus withstood Loyola, returned to Barcelona, which he reached in 1524. Okay, so he didn't get to do what he wanted to do. Um, you know, the head of the, of the Catholics there said, no, I don't think so. You're not going to go to battle over there with these Muslims. And if you continue to try to do that, you're going to be excommunicated. So he had to stop. But that didn't stop Ignatius Loyola. Let's continue. Let's continue. Derision and insults awaited his arrival in his native Spain. His countrymen failed to see the grand aims he cherished beneath his rags. Nor could they divine the splendid career and the immortality of fame which were were to emerge from this present squalor and debasement. But not for one moment did Loyola's own faith falter in his great destiny. He had the art known only to those fated to act a great part of converting impediments into helps and extracting new experience and fresh courage from disappointment. His repulsion from the holy fields had taught him that Christendom and not Asia, was the predestined scene of his warfare, and that he was to do battle not with the infidels of the East, but with the ever-growing host of heretics in Europe, but to meet the Protestant on his own ground and to fight him with his own weapons was a still more difficult task than to convert the Saracen. He felt that meanwhile he was destitute of the necessary qualifications, but it was not too late to acquire them. Okay, so 
Ignatius Loyola saw that his mission from God, he saw clearly now, it was not to go convert the Muslims, to war against the Muslims, but it was to go after the Protestants. And that is why the Jesuits are called the Counter Reformation, because that was their main goal in being created was to fight against the Protestant Reformation. And we see the beginnings of that here. Though a man of 35, he put himself to school at Barcelona, and there, seated amid the youth of the city, he prosecuted the study of Latin. Having acquired some mastery of this tongue, he removed to the University of Alcala to commence theology. This was in 1526. In a little space he began to preach, discovering a vast zeal in the propagation of his tenets, and no little success in making disciples, male and female, the Inquisition, deeming both the man and his aim somewhat mysterious, arrested him. Okay, so now he's arrested by the Inquisition. They didn't know what was going on with this guy. The order of the Jesuits was on the point of being nipped in the bud, but finding in Loyola no heretical bias, the fathers dismissed him on his promise of holding his peace. He repaired to Salamanca, but there too he encountered similar obstacles. It was not agreeable thus to champ the curb of privilege and canonical authority, but administered to him a wholesome discipline. It sharpened his circumspection and shrewdness, without in the least abating his ardor. Holding fast by his grand purpose, he quitted his native land and, repairing in 1528 to Paris, entered himself as, as a student in the College of St. Barbara. Okay, so he's, he's uh, you know, he had a little bit of a scare there when he was arrested by the Inquisition, but he was released, and now he went to Paris to continue his education because... He, th he thought that in order to do battle against the Protestants, he was going to have to raise his level of education. And so that's what he did. In the world of Paris, he became more practical. But the flame of his enthusiasm still burned on. Through penance, through study, through ecstatic visions. Again, I have that highlighted because we see that again through ecstatic visions. Over and over again, he has to have these visions, and the visions are what primarily guide him on his path. Very similar today to the charismatic movement. Visions and signs and wonders, and that's what they seek after. And what's interesting about that is a lot of them actually take influence from Catholic mystics. And, as we'll see later, Jesuit writings are actually influential on these movements, including the spiritual exercises, which we'll talk about, and other writings. Uh, they're influential today with contemplative prayer, uh, charismatic movement, all these other types of things. They have a huge influence that comes to them from the Jesuits and from Catholic mystics. But anyways, he has ecstatic visions and occasional checks he pursued with unshaken faith and unquenched resolution his celestial calling as the leader of a mighty spiritual army, of which he was to be the creator and which was to wage victorious battle with the host of Protestantism. Loyola's residence in Paris, which was from 1528 to 1535, coincides with the period of greatest religious excitement in the French capital. Discussions were at the time, that time of hourly occurrence in the streets, in the halls of Sarbonne and at the royal table. Loyola must have witnessed all the stirring and tragic scenes we have already described. He may have stood by the stake of Berquin. He had seen with indignation, doubtless, the saloons of the Louvre opened for the Protestant sermon. He had felt the great shock which France received from the placards and taken part, it may be, in the bloody rites of her great day of expiation. It is easy to see how, amid excitements like these, Loyola's zeal would burn stronger every hour. But his ardor 
did not hurry him into action till all was ready. The blow he mediated was great, and time, patience, and skill were necessary to prepare the instruments by whom he was to inflict it. Okay? He wanted to inflict a blow, a very big blow, to the Protestants. And so even though he had very strong zeal, it was tempered. It was controlled. And this actually the Jesuits became known for was extreme discipline. Okay? Extreme zeal, but also submission and discipline. Control. Because they needed that control, that uh, discipline, in order to accomplish their goals undetected. They knew, and Ignatius Loyola knew, that if he let his, his zeal out of control and he just was controlled by his zeal all the time, then he would not be able to accomplish the goals that he wanted to. And he would get in trouble and he'd be stopped before he was able to accomplish them. Okay? So the discipline is important. He had patience. A lot of patience. Let's continue. It chanced that two young students... Let's see the uh, first disciples. It chanced that two young students shared with Loyola his rooms in the College of St. Barbara. The one was Peter Faber from Savoy. His youth had passed amid his father's flocks. The majesty of the silent mountains had sublimed his natural piety into enthusiasm. And one night on bended knee under the star-bestudded vault, he devoted himself to God in a life of study. The other companion of Loyola was Francis Xavier of Pamplona in Navarre. For 500 years, his ancestors had been renowned as warriors, and his ambition was, by becoming a scholar, to enhance the fame of his house by adding to its glory in arms the yet pure glory of learning. These two, the humble Savoyard and the highborn Navarres, Loyola had resolved should be his first disciples. Okay? Loyola's first disciples in the founding of the Jesuits were Peter Faber and Francis Xavier. I'm going to learn a little bit about the beginning of uh, what he did with these guys in their training. Right? Because you know he's developing the training, the exercises, the disciplines, and all these other types of things that would be used for the next 500 years for all the other Jesuits. As the artist selects his block and with skillful eye and plastic hand bestows touch after touch of the chisel till at last the superfluous parts are cleared away and the statue stands forth so complete and perfect in its symmetry that the dead stone seems to breathe, so did the future general of the Jesuit army proceed to mold and fashion his two companions, Faber and Xavier. The former was soft and pliable, and easily took the shape which the master hand sought to communicate. The other was obdurate, like the rocks of his native mountains, but the patience and genius of Loyola finally triumphed over his pride of family and haughtiness of spirit. The first of all won their affection, I'm sorry, he first of all won their affection by certain disinterested services. He next excited their admiration by the loftiness of his own asceticism. He then imparted to them his grand project and fired them with the ambition of sharing with him in the accomplishment of it. Having brought them thus far, he entered them on a course of discipline, the design of which was to give them those hardy qualities of body and soul which would enable them to fulfill their lofty vocation as leaders in an army, every soldier in which was to be tried and hardened in the fire as he himself had been. Okay, so, you know, he's really sucking these guys into his vision. And, you know, he did whatever it took. And he was very good at persuading people. We'll see that in, you know, in time to come. But right now with these two guys, he knew exactly what to do to get them to buy into his vision. Okay? And he got them lock, stock, and barrel to 
to he painted a picture for them as to what he wanted to do and got them to buy into it and very very strongly and take a look at what he did that made this con that he actually had control over them we'll see and look at what he did to gain control over these guys he exacted of them frequent confession he was equally rigid as regarded their participation in the Eucharist the one exercise trained them in submission the other fed the flame of their zeal and thus the two cardinal qualities which Loyola demanded in all his followers were developed side by side okay so this is really important it says that he made sure he frequently did confession with them and that they did the a Eucharist okay now it says with confession that was an exercise training them in submission and with the Eucharist that was to feed the flame of their zeal combine this together submission and zeal the submission the discipline uh, well actually the the submission okay how does that work well through confession they are confessing to Ignatius their sins and so this is a form of exercising control over someone if you know someone's secret sins well you've got something to hang over their head don't you because not only do you have it sort of like uh, blackmail that you could use against them at any time hang it over their head but also it gives them more uh, gives them more insight into the deeper recesses of their mind shows maybe some things they might be insecure about and he would be able to use that to manipulate them it's very insidious but that's but this is exactly what it was doing and if you really think about it the confessional uh, is used all throughout the world is a tool of control and this has been you know proven throughout history that even you know there were people that were in very high positions of power and authority who went to confession and guess what they gave out some information that's passed around through the Catholic Church through the priesthood and it was used for political purposes as well and is used to control the confessional was used to control kings to control kings leaders of the world and so the con uh, confession is very important not only in the Catholic Church in general but we see here in the Jesuit order it was absolutely essential that for them to be co totally submitted they have to do confession and the other thing was the Eucharist right and we know in the Catholic Church when they have the Eucharist they have the Mass they believe in what is called transubstantiation that the priest has the power to transform the wafer the Eucharist into the literal body and soul of Jesus Christ okay and this they said was to feed their flame of their zeal because when they participate in the Eucharist and they do it on a consistent basis they have they think about it they believe they are consuming Christ literally literally consuming Christ and so when you combine their beliefs in regards to that plus having all these visions you know you have a formula that just fans the flame of their zeal again this is a zeal for God not according to knowledge to where they'll go anywhere and do anything and so you combine that submission and that zeal together it's a very 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 powerful formula for control over the disciples in the order and for uh, building this army okay let's continue severe bodily mortifications were also enjoined upon them three days and three nights did he compel them to fast 
during the severest winters when carriages might be seen to traverse the frozen sea in, he would not permit Faber the slightest relaxation of discipline. Thus it was that he mortified their pride, taught them to despise wealth, schooled them to brave danger and contemn luxury, and inured them to cold, hunger, and toil. In short, he made them dead to every passion save that of the holy war in which they were to bear arms. Okay, so here's another good point, important point, which is that, you know, everything in this Jesuit order, um, they are counterfeiting what is part of the genuine Christian life. Okay, because here he was making them dead to every passion save that of their holy war, the mission, right, to fight against the Protestants, the heretics, right? But when it's, you know, when it comes to real salvation in Christianity, you are supposed to be dead to sin, dead to the world, right? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You're supposed to be crucified to the flesh and, and, these, and sin and these types of things. But... What we have here is a counterfeit of that, that yes, they're dying to all their, their passions and everything, but this it's an artificial mortification so that they can only be alive to, not be alive to a genuine submission to uh, things that are righteous in the Word of God, but a, alive only to the mission of the superior general of the Jesuits to do exactly, be perfectly submitted to what he wants them to do. And that that is the difference. And it's a counterfeit. Obedience. Okay. But you can see with this mortification that he did with the with the fasting and going through all the, these trials and, and really rough uh, uh, situations that he put them through, it, he was hardening them, right? Again, this is supposed to be a military order. He was making soldiers for the Pope and for the, the Black Pope, the Superior General, right? Who the first one would be, Ignatius Loyola. A beginning had been made. The first recruits had been enrolled in that army, which was speedily to swell into a mighty host and unfurl its gloomy ensigns and win its dismal triumphs in every land. We can imagine Loyola's joy as he contemplated these two men, fashioned so perfectly in his own likeness. In his own likeness. See the counterfeit there? He was fashioning these men in his own likeness, not in the likeness of Jesus Christ. There's the counterfeit. The same master artificer, who had molded these two could form others, in short, any number. The list was soon enlarged by the addition of four other disciples. Their names, obscure then, but in after years to shine with the fiery splendor, were Jacob Lyonez, Alfonso Salmaron, Nicholas Bobadilla, and Simon Rodriguez. The first three were Spaniards, the fourth was a Portuguese, they were seven in all. But the accession of two others increased them to nine, and now they resolved on taking their first step. Okay? So now he has his first disciples, his nine companions. And let's see what happens. On the 15th of August, 1534, Loyola, followed by his nine companions, entered the subterranean chapel of the Church of Montmartre at Paris. And mass being said by Faber, who had received priest orders, the company, after the usual vow of chastity, chastity and poverty, took a solemn oath to dedicate their lives to the conversion of the Saracens, or should circumstances make them that attempt impossible, to lay themselves and their services unreservedly at the feet of the Pope. They sealed their oath by now receiving the host. Okay? So they sealed it by receiving the host, the wafer, in the Mass. The day was chosen because it was the anniversary of the Assumption of the Virgin, and the place because it was consecrated to Mary, 
the Queen of Saints and Angels, from whom, as Loyola firmly believed, he had received his mission. mission. Okay? So, uh, Ignatius of Loyola firmly believed he had received his mission from Mary. Okay, so he has all these mis these visions, right? But what you will notice is, yeah, they'll have visions of Christ sometimes. But the primary focus is usually Mary, not Christ. Okay, Mary is placed at a status not only equal to Christ, but even above Christ because they talk about her so much. And so he believes he received his mission from Mary. The army thus enrolled was little, and it was great. It was little when counted, it was great when weighed. In sublimity of aim and strength of faith, using the term in its mundane sense, it wielded a power before which nothing on earth, one principle accepted, should be able to stand. To foster the growth of this infant Hercules, Loyola had prepared beforehand his book entitled Spiritual Exercises. Okay, so now we're going to get into this. We're going to get into the spiritual exercises created by Ignatius of Loyola, and we're going to see, we're going to see exactly what these exercises were. We're going to examine that. This is a body of rules for teaching men how to conduct the work of their quote-unquote conversion because it's a counterfeit conversion. It consists of four great meditations, and the penitent retiring into solitude is to occupy absorbingly his mind on each in succession during the space of the rising and setting of seven suns. It may be fitly styled a journey from the gates of destruction to the gates of paradise, mapped out in stages so that it might be gone in the short period of four weeks. Okay, it takes four weeks to go through these exercises. There are few more remarkable books in the world. It combines the self-denial and mortification of the Brahmin with the asceticism of the Anchorite and the ecstasies of the schoolman. It professes, like the Quran, to be a revelation. The book of exercises, says a Jesuit, was truly written by the finger of God and delivered to Ignatius by the Holy Mother of God. Okay? So... You can see how they're talking about this, that it professes to be a revelation from God, written by the finger of God, delivered by the Holy Mother of God. They're saying Mary. Written by the finger of God, delivered by Mary. Okay, so it sounds like they're talking about this, these spiritual exercises as if they're inspired writing. As if it's an inspired book. Well, I've got a couple scriptures for that. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay? So we have a specific commandment in the word of God. Proverbs 30, right in verse 6, which says... Add thou not unto his words. Do not add to the word of God. Now, the word of God was inspired. The canon of scripture was completed. And there is no more words to add to that book. But then, now in the 1500s, Ignatius of Loyola says, no, no, no. We're going to add the spiritual exercises. This comes from God. Okay? And it's directly against the Word of God to add to the, the Scriptures and say that something is on equal footing as Scripture, saying it's written by God. Here's another Scripture. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now we can take this two ways. First of all, he should have, uh, you know, turned to this scripture himself, Ignatius of Loyola. Right? 
believe not every spirit. Why does he believe every vision that comes along or every spirit that whispers in his ear saying, I am Mary, I am Christ, I am this and I'm that, saying it's all from God. But instead the Bible says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Try them, test them. But he never did. Ignatius Loyola never tested the spirits whether they are of God. Never. He automatically, automatically believed this is from Christ, this is from Mary, I believe this is good. And that's what he did with the spiritual exercises. Now, the second way we can apply this is today. People need to test the writings of Ignatius Loyola or of any pope, any Catholic writings, and try the spirits whether they're of God. Don't just believe it right away and say, oh, this, is, this claims to be, you know, they believe that their tradition is on equal footing with Scripture. Prove it. Does it contradict Scripture? How do you try it? That's the only way to try it. Think about that. If the Bible says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they're of God, how are you supposed to do that? It's by Scripture. That's it. That's the only way. There is no other way. Otherwise, it's all based on your own feelings and, and visions and, and interpretations. And anyone could claim anything. But there has to be an objective standard. That standard is the Word of God. And so when these, you know, the Jesuits, like Ignatius Loyola, or any other Catholics, any popes come up with things, and they say, oh, this is from God, you have to go, hey, I'm going to try the spirits, and I'm going to see if your statement lines up with the Word of God. And if it doesn't, if it contradicts it, I'm throwing it out. Add thou not to the Word of God. And that's what should be done. But it's not. Okay, so anyway, it's supposed to be, you know, uh, written by the finger of God. But let's take a look at these spiritual exercises. What was this all about? The spiritual exercises, we have said, was a body of rules by following which one could effect upon himself that great change which in biblical and theological language is, to, is termed conversion. Okay, so basically, okay, plainly just to say this, the spiritual exercises were designed to be, to counterfeit the experience of being born again. That is essentially what this is. Now, this is one of the most diabolical things created by the devil, in my opinion, okay? This came straight from the pit of hell, and it was designed to be a counterfeit conversion that stretches out over a month. Okay, so let's look at what happens in there. The book displayed on the part of its author great knowledge of the human heart, Yes, exactly. Great knowledge of the human heart. And that's not a good thing. It's the great knowledge so that they can manipulate the human heart. The method prescribed was an adroit imitation of that process of conviction, of alarm, of enlightenment, and of peace through which the Holy Spirit leads the soul that undergoes that change in very deed. This divine transformation was at that hour taking place in thousands of instances in the Protestant world. Loyola, like the magicians of old who strove to rival Moses, wrought with his enchantments to produce the same miracle. Let us observe how he proceeded. And that's a perfect way of putting it. He was just like the witches, the sorcerers in Egypt, who were counterfeiting the miracles of God. He threw down the staff and became a serpent. They did the same thing, right? And all these other types of things. But their power only went so far. He did the miracle of lice. The magician said, we can't do this. Okay, so it was limited. But these magicians in Egypt, these sorcerers, counterfeited the power of God, the miracles of God. That's exactly what Loyola was doing. Striving to counterfeit the miracle of conversion, of being born again, regeneration. 
It's very insidious, very subtle. All right, so let's get into the four points here from the exercises. The person was, first of all, to go aside from the world by entirely isolating himself from all the affairs of life. In the solemn stillness of his chamber, he was to engage in four meditations each day. The first at daybreak, the last at midnight. To assist the action of the imagination. Okay, I want you to pay attention to that. Because I highlighted here, it says the imagination. We're going to study this more in depth later. Because this is the entire thing of the exercises is based all on the imagination. Okay, so we'll talk about that later. To assist the action of the imagination of the soul, the room was to be artificially darkened and on its walls were to be suspended pictures of hell and other horrors. Now that sounds awful. This sounds totally demonic. You're supposed to go in a darkened room and have pictures of hell and other horrific things hanging on the wall, people being uh, tortured. Okay, this is awful. Absolutely awful. But that's what he needed in order to create this counterfeit conversion. It's like he's trying to counterfeit a fear of God and a fear of hell. He's trying to force it through using visualization, paintings, not the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So think about this though. They're supposed to go, first of all, you're, this is supposed to be right like a conversion and he tells them to go into a darkened room. Well, I can't help but notice quite a bit of scripture popping out in my head in regards to going into darkness in order to... You want to go closer to God, so you go into darkness? How does that make any sense? Let's read some scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations... And their foolish heart was darkened. Now isn't that interesting? That number one, it talks about imaginations, became vain in their imaginations. Number two, their foolish heart was darkened. So the connection here between the vain imaginations and the darkened heart. Now, the Bible doesn't have anything good to say about darkness. Let's see another scripture. Luke chapter 1 verse 78, the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Okay, so Jesus Christ is supposed to come to lost people and lost people are described as sitting in darkness, in the shadow of death, sitting in darkness, darkened heart, over and over again it talks about darkness as something bad in the Bible. Rulers of the darkness of this world, right? But as part of his spiritual exercises, they, they're supposed to go to a dark room and use their imagination. It doesn't make any sense, biblically speaking, if you're talking about wanting to draw an eye to God. Now, it makes perfect sense if you're, conver if you're doing a counterfeit conversion. Okay. Men love darkness rather than light. Because why? Their deeds are evil. Let's continue. Sin, death, and judgment were exclusively to occupy the thoughts of the penitent during the first week of his seclusion. He was to ponder upon them till, in a sense, he beheld the vast conflagration of hell, its wailing, shrieks, and blasphemies, felt the worm of conscience, in fine, touched those fires in whose contact the souls of the reprobate are scorched. Okay, he's supposed to envision hell. The Bible never tells you to do this, by the way. To sit here and, let me try to picture hell. No. Never says to do that. Second week. The second week, he was to withdraw his eye from the dreadful, from these dreadful spectacles and fix it upon the incarnation. It is no longer the wailings of the lost that fill the ear as he sits in his darkened chamber. It is the song of the angel announcing the birth of the child and Mary acquiescing in the work of redemption. Of course, got to bring Mary into it. 
At the feet of the Trinity, he is directed to pour out the expression of the gratitude and praise with which continued meditation on these themes causes his soul to overflow. The third week is to witness the solemn act of the soul's enrollment in the army of that great captain who bowed the heavens and came down to in his incarnation. Two cities are before the devotee, Jerusalem and Babylon, in which he will choose to dwell. Which is interesting because of Revelation 17 talks about mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, which no one, no one fits better than the Catholic Church. All you have to look at is how it says she was drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, drunk with the blood of the saints. Who has killed more Christians in history? It doesn't even come close. It's not even a debate as to how many millions of Christians were slaughtered by the Catholic Church. And so it's funny as he's, oh, it's choose Babylon or Jerusalem. And they claim that they're going to choose Jerusalem, but they actually are going to Babylon. They choose Babylon. Two standards are displayed in his sight under which he will fight. Here a broad and brave pennon floats freely in the wind. Its golden folds bear the motto, Pride, Honor, Riches. Here is another, but how unlike the motto inscribed upon it, Poverty, Shame, Humility. On all sides resounds the cry, To arms! He must make his choice, and he must make it now, for the seventh son of his third week is hastening to the setting. It is under the banner of poverty that he elects to win the incorruptible crown. Now, I have a, this is where I wanted to make a comment about this, about poverty, right? So the Jesuits take an oath of poverty, right? They, under the banner of poverty, they elect to win the incorruptible crown. Now, this is, I think, an important distinction to make here because, you know, the Bible warns against um, riches, right? It says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. There's a lot of warnings against riches, trusting in riches especially, right? Rich people that won't give up their riches and, and, and these types of things. But some try to make it a virtue out of being poor and out of poverty, which is not, Scripture doesn't teach that either, okay? There is nothing inherently virtuous about being poor or of poverty, Okay, absolute poverty. There is nothing virtuous about that. In fact, what's interesting is there's actually multiple scriptures that speak negatively of poverty. I'm going to give you a couple right now. A couple scriptures. Proverbs 13, 18 says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Okay, so in this scripture... Poverty is not spoken of in a good way. In fact, poverty is talked about as a negative consequence to people that refuse instruction. It's not a good thing. It's Poverty is not spoken of uh, well in the Bible. And here's another scripture I think very applicable. Proverbs 30 verse 8 says, Remove me far from vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. So you might, you might have read the scripture before, but what does it say? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Okay? So you don't need riches, like it says, lest you be full and forget God, but not poverty either. Not abject poverty. Just food convenient for me. What does that mean? Just enough to cover your basic needs. You have food, clothing, and shelter. You have basic needs to pay for, you know, whatever. Basic things, your car, gas, Whatever you need to survive, then that's great. That's good. But you don't, there's no virtue in poverty in and of itself. But that's what they say, right? They take an oath of poverty under the banner of poverty. They elect to win an incorruptible crown. As it's, it's a very much a pharisaical thing. It's like, look at me. Oh, look at them. They take an oath of poverty. They're so righteous. Well, it doesn't make you righteous. Some of the most covetous people in the world live in poverty. The, the Bible says the sluggard desires to have, but he, ne he cannot obtain. Okay? So, 
let's not get confused and get out of balance with that as well. The Bible says a false bomb, uh, balance is an abomination to the Lord. All right, so that's a little comment on poverty. Let's continue. Now comes his fourth and last week of the exercises. And with it, there comes a great change in the subjects of his meditation. He is to dismiss all gloomy ideas, all images of terror. The gates of Hades are to be closed and those of a new life opened. Now remember, throughout all these weeks of spiritual exercises, he is pretty much exclusively using his imagination and visualizing all these different things. Okay? Imagination and visualization is what they're doing for a month. Okay? For an entire month trained to use the imagination this way. Um, it is morning with him. It is a springtime that has come to him. And he is to surround himself with light and flowers and odors. It is the Sabbath of a spiritual creation. He is to rest and to taste in that rest the prelude of the everlasting joys. This mood of mind he is to cultivate while seven suns rise and set upon him. He is now perfected and fit to fight in the army of the great captain. Okay, so uh, what's interesting is it kind of sounds like some. T it sounds like an initiation, right? It is an initiation, obviously, but it sounds almost like a, a Masonic initiation too, right? That there's all this darkness and stuff. They have these uh, Freemasons. They they go through uh, and they're blindfolded and and they say all these things to them and they point a dagger at them and then they ask them what they want and they sp they're supposed to say light, right? They take off the blindfold, they show them a bright light. There's always these types of things in initiations and occult orders and mystery religions that you go from this process of where you're in darkness and death in the skull and bones, they, they have them lay down in a coffin and do gross things. And then they come out, they rise from the dead, they resurrect, they're exposed to the light. Now they come out the other side. Now, usually with these initiations, it doesn't usually take this long, but the Jesuits, it takes a month. It takes that long. But again, it's like an occult initiation. Okay? And so, now we're going to go, we're going to jump to a um, study to examine uh, visualization and imagination because that's primarily what these exercises are based off of. So we're going to go through that real quick. And then we'll finish up the teaching with the end of the history, the founding of the order, and we'll be done. But right now, we're going to switch to uh, a study on visualization and imagination. All right, so let's take a look here at uh, visualization and imagination. A little bit of a study here. Visualization or imaginative prayer is popular throughout evangelicalism because of the spread of Roman Catholic contemplative mysticism. Jesuit priest Anthony de Mello calls it fantasy prayer and says that many of the Catholic saints practiced it. And here's the book, Sadhana, A Way to God. Okay, fantasy prayer. Many Catholic saints, I'm sure many Catholics did practice that. Francis of Assisi imagined taking Jesus down from the cross. Anthony of Padua imagined holding the baby Jesus in his arms and talking with him. Teresa of Avila imagined herself with Jesus in his agony in the garden. So again, like they called it fantasy prayer, that's all this is. That's all this is. It's complete fantasy. Understand that. They're imagining that they they saw this stuff and that they're there going through these things, and it's complete delusion. They haven't been through any of it. Visualization is an important part of these spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. The practitioner is instructed to walk into biblical and extra-biblical historical scenes through the imagination and bring the scene to life by applying all of the senses. Okay? So, when he tells people to, uh, seeing the, to see the events, hear what people are saying, smelling, tasting, touching things, all within the realm of the imagination to completely immerse themselves and visualize every aspect that you can to the to the, as much detail as you can in experiencing these types of things these uh, events in history 
That's what he teaches. The visualizing prayer practitioner is even taught to insert himself into the scene, taking, um, talking to the biblical characters and serving them. Ignatius encourages practitioners, for example, to imagine themselves present at Jesus' birth and crucifixion. Okay? And, yeah, so he teaches all these other types of things. Imagining you're here you're in this point in history, when this happens, when this happens, and just completely using the imagination the whole time. So, like I said, in all four weeks of the spiritual exercises, all they're doing is using the imagination and he teaches this over and over again and guess what people do this today people follow this Ignatius's uh, spiritual exercises and other types of uh, uh, visualization contemplative prayer they are taught to do visualization using the imagination so well, let's look at some excer excerpts from Ignatius' spiritual exercises. Let's read some of these quotes uh, where he's telling people to use their imagination to visualize things. Quote, Imagine Christ our Lord present before you upon the cross and begin to speak with him. Spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius uh, from the first week. Here's another one. Here it will be here it will be to see in imagination the length of breadth and depth of hell to see in imagination the vast fires and the souls enclosed to hear the wailing with the sense of smell to perceive the smoke to taste the bitterness to touch the flames first week fifth exercise fifth exercise another quote i will see and consider the three divine persons seated on the royal dais or throne of the divine majesty I will see Our Lady and the angels saluting her. I will see Our Lady, Saint Joseph, the maid, the child Jesus after his birth. I will make myself a poor little unworthy slave and as though present, look upon them, contemplate them, and serve them. From the second week. And last quote. While one is eating, let him imagine he sees Christ our Lord and his disciples at the table and consider how he eats and drinks, how he looks, how he speaks, and then strive to imitate him from the third week. Okay, so over and over and over again, Ignatius of Loyola is telling people, imagine this, imagine this, imagine this, <laughs> right? Just use your imagination and you're just making things up that are nowhere in Scripture. In fact, inserting yourself, pretending that you're what? Time traveling back then, imagining that you're there for what? Why? Why are you doing this? The Bible never tells you to do this. Ever. Okay? Now, it's interesting because over and over again, he's saying, imagine, right? Imagine Christ present before you. Visualizing, using the imagination. Over and over again, he talks about imagination. Now, what does the Bible have to say about imagination? Well, I could tell you right off the bat. Let me just tell you right up front. The Bible doesn't have anything good to say about the imagination. Literally nothing good at all. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. Type in imagination or imaginations in the Bible. Look at every single occurrence and tell me if you see anything good. Tell me if you see anything good. The majority of it is bad. So let's look at what the Bible has to say about imagination. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. <laughs> well, we're not doing too good to start off. Another one. Jeremiah 7, 24. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Jeremiah 11, 8. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Jeremiah 13, 10. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart. Jeremiah 16, 12. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that ye may not hearken unto me. That they may not hearken unto me. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Now, what's interesting here, in this passage, Jeremiah 23, verse 16 says, they speak, it's talking about false prophets, right? They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Guess what? That's a perfect description of Ignatius of Loyola. He speaks a vision of his own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Doesn't come from the word of God. It doesn't come from God at all, but it's a vision of his own heart. And what else does it say? Those false prophets that speak a vision of their own heart speak to those that walk after the imagination of their own heart. No evil should come upon you. They say good things to the people that walk after the imagination of their own heart. Notice how Imagination is always connected to man's heart, right? Every time it says imagination, most every time it's connected to man's heart. Now, what does the Bible say about man's heart? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So over and over again, the Bible connects imagination to the heart it says the heart is deceitful. It says the heart is wicked and evil. And it says those who are following the imagination of their heart are disobedient to God and refuse to listen to the word of God. Then we're supposed to think using our imagination in prayer is a good thing? Right? So after looking at all that, we are supposed to come to the conclusion that using our imagination in prayer to visualize and do all these things is supposed to be something God wants us to do? God forbid! It sounds like the opposite of what God wants us to do. What does the Bible say we should do instead with our imagination? Well, let's look. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down what? Imaginations. That's right. Casting down. We're not supposed to feed into imaginations and sit here and visualize for a month with imaginations. No, we're supposed to cast them down. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, isn't it interesting that the Bible's talking about spiritual warfare, right? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? Some about uh, spiritual warfare. God is talking about how to fight it. And one of the ways that we fight in spiritual warfare is to cast down imaginations. Now, an Ignatius of Loyola is saying, no, instead of casting down imaginations, we need to feed into imaginations and we need to visualize all these different scenes throughout history and different types of events from the Bible and outside of the Bible and feed into the imaginations. Now, if God is showing us casting down imaginations is an effective tactic, tactic in spiritual warfare to fight against the devil, but Ignatius of Loyola is telling us to do the opposite, where do you think he learned that? And where do you think he's getting it from to tell you? Not from God. It sounds like it is from the devil himself to tell Christians... No, don't cast down imaginations. Feed into imaginations for a month straight. Shut out the windows. Cut out all the light. Hey, I know. How about you get into a sensory deprivation tank and float in there in, in, a stasis, in stasis? Take some LSD. Visualize. That's what they did in MK Ultra. Go look up John C. Lilly. Okay? It's all about the imagination. Yeah, that's right. Actually, imagination is used in mind control. And guess what? 
Ignatius of Loyola was a absolute master of mind control. And that's why he made the most obedient, zealous army in history. And he did, he did it utilizing the imagination. Now, we are told in the Bible to pray for many different things. We're told to pray for our daily needs, to confess our sins to God, not to a priest, to confess our sins, to give thanks, to pray to our fam. I'm sorry, to our family, <laughs> to pray for our family, to pray for fellow saints, to pray for our enemies, to pray for all in authority, to pray for many other things, right? There's all types of things in the Bible that talks about praying for different things, different types of prayer, giving thanks and praise to God, right? But what we are never told to do in the Bible is use our imagination and visualize Jesus or Mary or saints or anything else when we pray. Never, not one time are we told to do that in the Bible. This is not only against Scripture, but it also opens the door for evil spirits to run wild with your imagination and lead you astray 100%. And that's exactly what happened to Ignatius Loyola. He did it himself. He used his imagination and did visualization and had visions, so many visions. And then he took these techniques, drilled them down and wrote them all down, made the manual, the spiritual exercises, and used it as a template to train all his future soldiers. We are not told to do that in the Bible. Okay, so that's a little bit of a study on the visualization and imagination used. Uh, it's the core of the spiritual exercises is utilizing the imagination. And it is also the core of the control over people's minds is utilizing the imagination. Okay. All right, so let's finish up the story for today. We're almost at the end. A not on similar course of mental discipline, as our history has already shown, did Wycliffe, Luther, and Calvin pass through before they became captains of the army of Christ. They began in a horror of great darkness. Through that cloud there broke upon them the revelation of the crucified. Now, you know, I've made comments in the past about Luther and stuff. I'm not a fan of Luther or Calvin either. But, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of good Protestant leaders. But the big difference here is they went through times of darkness, right, and, and trials, sure. But it doesn't mean they literally went into a darkened room and sat here and were visualizing things and using their imagination. Okay, they just went through trials. Through that cloud there broke through them the revelation of the crucified, throwing the arms of their faith around the tree of expiation and clinging to it. They entered into peace and tasted the joys to come. How like yet how unlike are these two courses? In the one, the penitent finds a savior on whom he leans. In the other, he lays hold on a rule by which he works and works as methodically and regularly as a piece of machinery. And that's a great description of, of the Jesuits. That it says in the one, the penitent, the, those that have repented and put in their faith in Jesus Christ, they find the savior and they lean on the savior. They put their faith in the savior, Jesus Christ, and they're justified by faith. But in the other, in the Jesuit, he lays hold on a rule by which he works. He works methodically like a piece of machinery. And that's exactly what they did. They're like machines. Beginning on a certain day, he finishes like a stroke of clock. Duly as the seventh sun of the fourth week is sinking below the horizon. We trace in the one the action of the imagination. There it is again. Fostering one overmastering passion into strength till the person becomes capable of attempting the most daring enterprises and enduring the most dreadful sufferings. In the other, we behold the intervention of a divine agent who plants in the soul a new principle and thence induces, induces a new life. Okay? One of them is born again. The other is a counterfeit using the imagination. Okay? Let's continue. 
The war in which Loyola and his nine companions enrolled themselves when on the 15th of August, 1534, they made their vow in the church of Montmartre was to be waged against the Saracens of the East. They acted so far in their original design as to proceed to Venice, where they learned that their project was meanwhile impracticable. impracticable. The war which had just broken out between the Republic and the port had closed the gates of Asia. They took this as an intimation that the field of their operations was to be in the Western world. Returning on their path, they now directed their steps toward Rome. Okay, now it's time to go to Rome, their home, in which now that is the place where the headquarters is to this day. In every town through which they passed on their way to the Eternal City, they left behind them an immense reputation for sanctity by their labors in the hospitals and their earnest ad addresses to the populace on the streets. As they drew nigh to Rome, and the hearts of some of his companions were beginning to despond, Loyola was cheered by a vision. Oh, just in time! Everyone's starting to get, you know, discouraged. What do we need? Let's have another vision. He has a vision in which Christ appeared and said to him, In Rome will I be gracious unto thee. And the, the hopes this vision inspired were not to be disappointed. Entering the gates of the capital of Christendom, and throwing themselves at the feet of Paul the Third, they met a most gracious reception. The Pope hailed their offer of assistance as most opportune. The Pope said, hey, perfect timing. Just what I need. A loyal army. <laughs> Mighty dangers at that hour threatened the papacy. And with the half of Europe in revolt and the old monkish orders become incapable this new and unexpected aid seemed sent by heaven, sent by hell. The rules and constitution of the new order were drafted and ultimately approved by the Pope. Two peculiarities in the constitution of the proposed order spe specially recommended it in the eyes of Paul III. The first was its vow of unconditional obedience. The society swore to obey the Pope as an army obeys its general. It was not canonical, but military obedience, which its members offered him. They would go to whatsoever place, at whatsoever time, and on whatsoever errand he should be pleased to order them. They were, in short, to be not so much monks as soldiers. The second peculiarity was that their services were to be wholly gratuitous, Never would they ask so much as a penny from the papal seat. But they had found they had they had ways of getting uh, money other ways. All right, uh, I've got two quotes here though. When it talks about their unconditional obedience to the Pope, check out these quotes I got for you. First, right here. Listen to this quote. Uh, let's see, if I can move this. There we go. Look at this quote. This is from the spiritual exercises of. St. Ignatius, and uh, yeah, this is a quote from that book. We must put aside all judgment of our own. Right, right away, that's a red flag. Put away all judgment of our own. Keep the mind ever ready and prompt to obey in all things the true spouse of Christ our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. We shall praise sacramental confession, the frequent hearing of mass, vows of religion, relics of the saints by venerating them, the regulations of the church, images and veneration of them. Finally, we must praise all the commandments of the church and be on the alert to find reasons to defend them and by no means in order to criticize them if we wish to proceed securely in all things. We must hold fast to the following principle. Listen to this. What seems to me white, I will believe black if the hierarchical church so defines. Okay? This is how insane their blind obedience was supposed, was supposed to be. He says, what seems to me white, I will believe it to be black if the church says so. I hate to tell you, but that is insane. That is absolutely insane. I don't know why I said I hate to tell you. I don't hate to tell you. <laughs> it's insane. Okay? If... I, 
Oh, the sky is green? Yep, the sky is green. If the church said so, it must be true. If it's, oh, he says it's, that's not white, it's black. Okay, it's black. You're not allowed to use your own judgment. See what he said at the beginning? We must put aside all judgment of our own. This is what insane blind obedience they were supposed to have. Let me give you one more quote from um, Ignatius. Let everyone persuade himself that he who lives... Let me get this on the screen. Let everyone persuade himself that he who lives under obedience should be moved and directed under divine providence by his superior, just as if he were a corpse, which allows itself to be moved and led in any direction. <laughs> okay? So, Ignatius of Loyola literally says, you should be a zombie. You're a corpse in the hands of your superior, the superior general of the Jesuits. You have absolutely no will of your own. Okay, so th you can see this is some hardcore mind control and brainwashing. And by the way, guys, this is t like two centuries before the creation of the Bavarian Illuminati. Ooh. Everybody talks about that, right? Adam Weishaupt, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Adam Weishaupt. Oh, you mean the Jesuit professor of canon law at Ingolstadt University? The Jesuit? Yeah. 200 years before that, we got some hardcore mind control. Okay? Where they say, oh, if, if, if we say that white is black, then that's what it is. You're a corpse. Hardcore obedience to the Pope and to the black Pope. Let's finish this up. It was resolved that the new order should bear the name of the company of Jesus. Loyola modestly declined the honor of being accounted its founder. Christ himself, he affirmed, had dictated to him its constitution in his cave at Manrasa. He was its real founder, whose name then could it be, could it so appropriately bear as his? The bull constituting it was issued on the 27th of September, 1540, and was entitled Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, and bore that the persons it enrolled into an army were to bear the standard of the cross, to wield the arms of God, and to serve the only Lord and the Roman Pontiff, his vicar on earth. That's right, they call the Roman Pontiff, the Pope, the vicar of Christ in place of Christ, because I want you to know something. A little side note here. A lot of people hear the word antichrist and they think of against Christ. Well, guess what? Anti doesn't just mean against. It also means in place of, substitute, or you could say vicar. So anyone who says he's a vicar of Christ is, by definition, antichrist. And that's exactly what the Pope Every single pope has been and is right now antichrist. Now, that was the beginning of the Jesuit order. 1540, it was founded. And based on these, um, you know, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, as you can see, developed these spiritual exercises using visualization, the imagination to uh, create a perfect tool for mind control, to engender submission, pure, unwavering obedience like you've ever, never seen before. Unconditional obedience as a corpse. And he crafted all these techniques and the rules and then it was ready to go the first uh, nine guys there. And so this is the story of how the Jesuit order came to be. And a little bit about, uh, you know, we did a little bit of a study on imagination and visualization. But well, like I said, that continues to this day. People still turn to, the, you know, recommend the Ignatius 
uh, Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises, this contemplative prayer, uh, visualization, all these are the types of things that's used in, you know, um, hypnotism and um, New Age movement, all kinds of stuff. So it's had a big impact on the world, still does to this day. So, but now you know where it comes from and how it developed. And uh, hopefully this was helpful to you to see uh, a lot of where this came from. And also to compare as much as we can every single point to the Bible and show how it goes directly against the Bible. Okay? Because they call, they're call they called the Society of Jesus. And they couldn't be farther from Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Now the Antichrist of the Catholic Church, oh absolutely. That's what they're all about. Okay? So, so that was that one. Um, we still have more to come. We see the next chapter is about the organization and training of the Jesuits. So there's, you know, there's quite a bit more to talk about in the future. We'll see where what direction we'll go about uh, with that. Uh, but I hope this has been a blessing to you. Hope you learn a lot. And I believe it's very important uh, subject matter to cover. And uh, you know, it covers a, a wide variety of of topics. And also you get some history in there and understand where we came from and, and what we're dealing with today as well. Alrighty. Well, thank you. I hope this was a blessing to you. Please like, share, subscribe. Check all the links in the description. And please copy and paste the links as well. That helps. And um, thank you for all the prayer and support. God bless you. Have a good day.